So hello again. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, neutrinos, photons, and black holes, and a little bit of gravity waves and how it all plays together, so to speak, to compare apples to apples, or um, the relationship between them and how one compares to the other. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. <laughs> um, so as I'm continuing to watch out for the Nova of T. Corona Borealis, which has not happened yet. I do watch uh, videos and read articles about science and technology and lots of physics related stuff, because as Don Franklin says, physics is everything. So I said, well, people may be hearing about different things involving stars and particles and how they all relate and what's this got to do with that. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll put something together that kind of tries to dovetail all that and you know make one thing distinct from another. So we'll talk about all those various particles and uh, black holes of different sizes and what's a quasar and all that kinds of stuff. Foundational information. So there is this thing called the standard model of elementary particles. And you probably have seen this before, where it talks about quarks and leptons and bosons and uh, photons and gluons and all that kinds of stuff. They all have their own place in the chart. And also each of them has their own energy. And whether their charge is, you know, a quarter, half, whatever, none, that kind of thing. And then their, it's not actually the rotation spin. It's just a property called spin. So you can see the little numbers in the corner of each one of the colored boxes. But I won't go into the details of each one of them. But there are a couple of them that I will be pointing out. All of these particles are things that have been confirmed to exist. And the Higgs is the latest one from a few years ago. It was postulated to have existed, but until they could actually confirm at the Large Hadron Collider that, yep, they found a Higgs, and then other scientists in other groups like Fermi Labs said, yep, you got a Higgs. It wasn't added to the table. But there are some things on this table that were not directly observed, they were only indirectly presumed to exist from observations. But that's the part they kind of leave out, is some of these things up until a year ago were never directly observed. They were only indirectly observed like a top quark. A top quark was never until two years ago directly observed. What was observed is when the top quark decayed, it produced some other particles. And those particles they did observe. But they said, hey, if we're going to see that and that and that combined with that, there must have been a top quark here. But they didn't see the top quark itself. That's changed recently. Uh, about a year ago, they actually detected an actual top quark. But it's been in the table for years. But that's like the asterisk that you don't see on the table is uh, some of these things were not directly observed. Now, the, these are all electromagnetic effect particles. Um, so you don't see things like, well, wh where are gravity waves in this? Well, gravity waves are a different animal. These are only the particles that you know we've measured and sort of observed and classified. And so that's why they're in the table. But that's foundational information. So when somebody says, I think I found a particle, okay, what 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 are the numbers? What is its mass, its charge, its spin? And then you find out, uh, that's a bottom quark. That's not a new quark. So you have to do your analysis. It's not just, I think I got one. You've got to prove you've got one. So let's start with neutrinos. Neutrinos are very weak, uh, very weakly interacting leptons. That's a classification of particles. These things come out of reactors, the sun, galaxies, other galaxies, and at a small level, even bananas. And they're everywhere, and they don't really have an effect on anything. So don't be worried about the fact that you know millions to billions of neutrinos are passing through you right now, and you don't even know it. Uh, the way we detect them is only indirectly. So when a neutrino interacts on those rare occasions with something, it slows that particle down. And when that particle puts the brakes on, it needs to release some energy. And it releases a specific color, a specific wavelength and frequency that's in the uh, sort of medium blue range. 
and that's called Cherenkov radiation. So whenever you see a uh, a picture of the well of a nuclear fission reactor, the water has this blue glow to it. That's Cherenkov radiation. That's from the neutrons coming out of the uh, core of the reactor, and they're interacting with things. And also neutrinos are coming out. And when the neutrinos interact with something, it slows that particle down enough where it's got to give up some energy to maintain its conservation of momentum and energy. And the way it does that is it releases a high energy blue photon. And the collective glow of the radioactive area, that blue, that collective blue is from all those particles that aren't interacting with you. They're interacting with the water and stuff in the water. And that's how they get the glow. But in air, they're happening all the time. You don't even notice it. So the way they detect these as a scientific research effort is they have giant tanks of liquids. Nowadays, it's mostly pure water, but in the past, it's even been like dry cleaning fluid. Inert liquids, and then when the neutrino interacts with something in the liquid, it then produces the spurt of blue, and the detectors on the outside wall of this giant liquid chamber detect that very, very dim light, and they track across a bunch of sensors where the blue light goes. So like, where did they first detect it? Where did it go? And by that, they can tell where it came from. They'll tout neutrinos as, very, as being very low energy, very low mass compared to other particles, very weakly interacting. And uh, they're certainly not as low mass as photons, which have no rest mass. But the three different flavors or kinds of neutrinos, the first is an electron neutrino, and it has an energy of 0.8 electron volts. Okay, that's very low. That's less than one electron volt. But the muon neutrino is a little more energetic. It's 0.17 million electron volts. That's, that's kind of a leap up there. But if you put it in the correct units of measure, since it's fractional, it should be 170,000 electron volts. That sounds like a bigger number. It's just how human brains work. The tau neutrino, now this is the neutrino that comes from interstellar space from other galaxies. They're very high in energy. It has 18.2 million electron volts. And if you go back to that chart, you'll see that 18.2 million electron volts is actually more energy than the particles that make up protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are made up of up and down quarks. So 18.2 million versus 2.16 million for the up quark and 4.7 million for the down quark. So I was always taught neutrinos are these really weak things. How is it the neutrinos actually have more energy than up and down quarks? Well, ignore the man behind the curtain. We're telling you it's weak. We're telling you it doesn't affect anything. Just ignore the fact that they have you know, tau neutrinos that have more energy than up and down quarks. Now, because they interact with so little um, neutrinos at their lowest level, the electron neutrinos are capable of escaping stellar fusion, the gravity of stars, nuclear reactors. So when um, we turn up a nuclear reactor on the planet, be it uh, fission or fusion, it's going to be producing neutrinos, and those neutrinos can be detected as a source on the planet by the instruments, these big places that we have that detect neutrinos. So they can say, oh yeah, ignore that area over there, that's that uh, power plant. The mid-level neutrinos from like our sun uh, and novas and supernovas, they go, they ignore the gravity of novas and supernovas, and they can come straight out of there faster than photons, or sooner than photons. I won't say faster because their upper limit is still the speed of light. But tau neutrinos that come from other galaxies, um, they're these really energetic ones. And they have enough energy to actually escape other galaxies, the, gra the collective gravity of another galaxy. So when they tell you things like neutrinos can't escape black holes, like, 
Okay, so they can escape fusion, they can escape novas and supernovas, and they can escape entire galaxies, including the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. What makes you think neutrinos can't escape a black hole? I think they ignore them, in my opinion. I think that they're just as irrelevant to black holes as they are to anything else. But think about it for a moment. If a neutrino could not escape a black hole, and there are all these neutrinos out there from all directions, every black hole that's getting saturated by neutrinos, those neutrinos would be adding to the black hole. Now, if it's just like the 0.8 electron volts of an electron neutrino, eh, that's not much. But now that you're talking about tau neutrinos being 18.2 million electron volts, uh, that starts to add up, especially if they're everywhere. I, I don't buy that neutrinos can't escape black holes, gravity. Otherwise, neutrinos would be the fuel to self-grow black holes. Let's talk about photons. Particles of electromagnetic energy we think of as light. Um, they have zero rest mass. So when you stop a photon, it has no mass. But when it's flying along, it has energy. And E equals mc squared. So energy and mass are related. So when you have a photon that's been emitted, it has a rest mass of zero. But while it's moving, it has energy. And the energy can be associated with momentum. So different photons have different amounts of energy. A photon passes through space kind of in a straight line from wherever it came from unless it's interacted with something. One of the fields that can interact with it is intense gravitational fields. So the photon thinks it's going on a straight path, but the fabric of space is bent by some large gravitational source, be it a, gra uh, a galaxy or a black hole, and the photon itself doesn't slow down, it just curves in its travel. The statement is that once a photon passes beyond the event horizon of a black hole, it's never going to come out again. Okay? If you've heard of Hawking radiation, this is the eventual, over a very long period of time, dissolving of black holes in order to keep uh, information theory stable. So you're not losing stuff from a black hole. So when the Hawking radiation comes out, it's radiation. It's electromagnetic radiation, which means that a particle of Hawking radiation is embodied in a photon, but that photon is escaping a black hole. How's that possible? Ask the questions. Unless acted upon, photons exist forever. If they don't get um, taken in by an atom, by electrons of an atom, then they just go on forever. Nothing stops them. If a photon interacts with the electrons in orbit around an atom, then the electron moves up to a higher energy shell and then doesn't like it there because it's already crowded and wants to move back down again. And when it moves back down to a lower energy shell, a photon comes out. If it's 100% efficient, then whatever energy goes in is the same as the energy that goes out. But Electrons are picky. If they see that the photon coming in has more energy than the items on the various levels would be willing to accommodate, that photon's ignored. It just passes right on through. If it's less than a level, you don't get like a fraction. But there are inefficiencies involving photons. So if there's an inefficiency, it usually means that whatever the residue of that interaction results in infrared. The easiest way to describe this is if I have a beam of light and I shine it on a mirror at an angle, then I don't lose much energy from the photons because they bounce off the mirror. If I shine the light directly into the mirror at 90 degrees at a, an oblique angle, then some of the photons actually wind up heating up the mirror and they transfer from whatever energy they were into infrared. So you have some debris, some residue of the interaction. As a result of that, photons, when they interact, can actually lose some energy. 
So if you have a certain level of energy photon going in and then it interacts, it can come out with a lower level photon energy going out and then you have a residue left of like infrared. That means that you now have photons going in of a certain level and when the photon comes back out, it's a lower level. And if you happen to have this uh, happening again and again and again over vast, you know, multiple light year distances, you're now slowly chipping away at the energy level of that photon. Once you get to a certain low level, that photon no longer excites the electrons. It's fallen below the threshold for that particular material. Therefore, you can't detect that photon. So as the universe is a very big place and there's photons everywhere, this slow chipping away at the energy level of photons eventually brings them down below the threshold where they can be detected, which means you've got, since the beginning of the universe, a huge quantity of photons still roaming around out there that are undetectable because they don't excite the electrons to the point where we can detect them. So let's let's do a little comparison here. Um, neutrinos versus photons. If I wanted to pick a property and then you know measure one, measure against the other to see like let's let's compare a neutrino's energy level to a photon's energy level. Photons are usually measured in uh, you know wavelengths like nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter, or microns, millionths of a meter, um, or frequency hertz, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. But you can convert those values so that you can measure a photon in electron volts, which is the same way we measure neutrinos. So if I said, how much energy does a photon have? Well, the highest energy photons are gamma photons. Gamma photons have just over 100,000 electron volts. And if you remember back to the particles chart, there were a lot of them in there that had millions of electron volts. So even the highest energy photons are still kind of lower than other particles, including neutrinos. But given that there's low energy neutrinos and high energy neutrinos, you have a relationship, which is what you see down at the bottom here. If I have a, that first symbol represents photon. The second symbol represents gamma. So it's a gamma photon. A gamma photon has more energy than a neutrino that is an electron neutrino, but it has less energy than a muon neutrino. And it has a lot less energy than a tau neutrino. So now you can see the energy apples to apples comparison between, well, photons just are nowhere near as much energy as neutrinos, and the highest energy neutrinos are a lot more energetic than photons. Remember that ultraviolet light is the thing that gives you skin cancer and ultraviolet light in the C band is the thing they use to disinfect hospitals. So even though it's way less energy, we use that for disinfecting things, which says, hey, the tau neutrino being so many more times more energy than a gamma photon, which is so many more times energy than an ultraviolet photon, that says these uh, tau neutrinos that are very weakly interacting, if we could find a way to make them interact, it would be a highly energetic interaction. So there you're comparing apples to apples, neutrinos to photons. But what about gravity waves? I heard about gravity waves. What about gravity waves? Photons are a measure of electromagnetic radiation. Gravity waves are not on that chart of particles because we have yet to find out what a graviton is if they do exist. We've measured gravity waves, but we don't measure them directly. What we measure is the expansion and contraction of space itself. So when there's a linear stretch, we use an, a technique called interferometry to measure the results of that stretching and squeezing. And that's how LIGO and Virgo and CAGRA all work is they send laser beams down two tubes, very long tubes, and they measure the travel time. They merge the beams back together and they put that into a sensor. When one of the tubes gets longer or shorter than the other tube, they can detect this as a difference 
and the interferometric um, measurement of these two tubes. So one tube gets longer or shorter than the other tube. They measure that as a detection. We've since then said, well, we want to measure even longer wavelengths of gravity waves. How do we do that? Well, there are these things called neutron stars that spin, and they put out very highly accurate pulses of energy that we can measure in radio waves here on Earth. If we measure that over a bunch of different pulsars and a gravity wave traverses that field of pulsars that we're measuring, that area will expand and contract, which means the timing of those highly accurate pulses changes. So there are pulsar timing arrays. One in the U.S. is called Nanograv, but there's an international collective of all over the planet pulsar timing arrays called the International Pulsar Timing Array. And that's how they measure these other kinds of gravity waves that LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA can't detect at all. But we're only touching like the surface of measuring gravity waves. Much like there's a cosmic microwave background from the Big Bang, there apparently is also a lot of gravity waves out there that now that we're starting to see the longer ones, there's a lot of them. And as we see that there's no limit to there being longer ones, we got to find a new way to measure them because our pulsar timing array, they're not big enough. We need something that's even bigger timing array to measure even longer distances. And I think it took 12 years for the IPTA to come away with their results as this is our detection of very long wavelength gravity waves because some of the gravity waves in the array took one year to go through a complete cycle. That's like a gravity wave that's a light year long, even longer. So now they're talking about building a new timing array that would actually be in space, where they, instead of having um, a certain number of miles like the LIGO tubes, they can have tens of thousands, maybe a million miles separation between the detectors. Now, that still would not be as accurate as the International Pulsar Timing Array because that's light years distance in directions. But they're now saying that, well, they may be, the signals may be so weak that we don't really have the technology for measuring them, that the amplitude of these very long gravity waves may be so small, they just kind of like fall below our radar, so to speak. And they're out there, they're plentiful, they're omnipresent, but we have no way to measure them. So they're looking for new and different ways to measure um, the very long wavelength and very low amplitude gravity waves. And now we get into the dark undetectable stuff. If if something is not detectable by our current, technolo uh, our current technology and the sensors that are embodied in that, then we call it dark. If it has an effect that we can't explain and we don't see any thing showing up on our sensors, we call that dark. It just means it's currently, with our given technology, undetectable. But we see the effect of it. Currently, we have no technology to actually directly detect this stuff. But we know it's there because we can see the effect of it. We can see the expansion of the universe by way of the red shift, the Doppler shift. So that would be dark energy pushing things apart. We don't see the dark energy, we just see things moving away at ever increasing acceleration. And we can measure that by the redshift. Dark matter, when we see a galaxy and that galaxy should be able to spread out more easily, something's holding it together that's an enormous amount of gravity. And then as the galaxy rotates, the stars on the outer edge of the galaxy are orbiting the galaxy at a speed that is not what we expected it to be. So something is holding them at that velocity and that holding the galaxy together and keeping the stars rotating at a certain speed, we just attribute that to dark matter. Now, because of the size of these things, the size of the universe and the size of galaxies, these are deemed to be very large sources of influence on matter and energy. So we attribute that to be, well, we, we can't figure out how much matter is, is in a galaxy, so we just 
say, um, you know, 70 plus to 80 percent of it must be dark matter. Unidentified, but holding things together and controlling spin. Well, when they first stated that, we thought there might be 100 million stars in the Milky Way. Now there's more like 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, and they're still keeping with the same percentages. So ask the question. As the saying goes, there's a fine distinction between presumed to exist yet undetectable as explanations for effect and incorrectly presuming the existence of something that doesn't exist, an unrecognized effect. If you want something analogous to that, it's like, does it ever strike you a little weird that it's harder to accept the presumption presumption of extraterrestrials um, than it is to readily accept the existence of dark matter and dark energy, which can't be directly measured. Well, we can't directly measure extraterrestrials because we haven't, and we haven't measured dark energy and dark matter directly because we haven't, but we're more willing to accept the existence of dark energy and dark matter than uh, you know, in extraterrestrials somewhere out there in the universe. Now, we're putting the judgment of extraterrestrials through enormous evidentiary hoops. Despite what we know about how many stars there are in the galaxy, how many galaxies there are in the universe, and how many exoplanets we're finding that are in the habitable zone. I mean, we found over 5,000 exoplanets just in our galaxy, of which I think we're now at about 60 that are in the habitable zone. We're just proclaiming that there's nothing alive on any of those. But for dark matter, uh, all we have to see is, hey, we can't explain why this galaxy is holding together or why the um, stars at the edge of the galaxy are moving at the speed they are. So that is assurance that dark matter exists. It's just something we can't explain, so we've labeled it as dark matter. So I found these, uh, some people might call them nits that I'm picking with the uh, standard model of elementary particles. When you're writing a scientific paper and you have lots of different numbers you're measuring, and some of those are very small numbers and some of those are very large numbers, there tends to be a technical documentation way of representing these things. You have multipliers, you have scales of measure, and in the metric system, you see things like, you know, nano this or mega that or giga that, or these are all just multipliers of the same units. And we have this unit called the electron volt. So if you have fewer electron volts, it might just be EV. Or you have thousands of electron volts, it might be KEV. If you have millions of them, it's MEV for millions. And if you have billions of them, it's G or giga, whatever those are. But I found this interesting that in the table, there is the charm quark. And notice that it's listed as approximately 1.2730 giga electron volts per speed of light squared. That's always the trailer, per speed of light squared. But the tau, which is not a neutrino, this is the tau similar to the electron, it's in the lepton category. The tau is listed as approximately 1776.93 mega electron volts. Why wouldn't that be 1.77693 giga electron volts? It just seems to be an oddity. Now you might say, oh, it's a typo by whoever created the table. This table has been around for decades. And nobody thought to like make all the units of measure the same. Like if, if it's really over a thousand mega, that should be a giga. That's just how you technically accurately document things. So if, if you were to take the tau particle and switch it up to identify it in giga electron volts, oh, look at that. The tau particle actually has more energy than the charm quark. Hmm. Makes one think. This particle that's not part of protons and neutrons and electrons, um, that's a free roaming particle, has a lot of energy in it, unlike the stuff that's inside the particles that make up an atom. And here's something more contemporary. What is the highest energy particle on that table? Well, you would say it's the Higgs boson, because they had to create the Large Hadron Collider in order to observe it, to detect it, to split it out, 
he needed all that smashing ability to you know break apart proton on proton collisions to get that Higgs boson out because it's a whopping uh, 125 giga electron volts. Um, really, the top quark is 172 giga electron volts, and it was discovered uh, back in 1994 at the Tevatron at Fermilab. Hmm. So here you have supposedly the Higgs boson, the newest, greatest, and we needed the LHC to, to be able to, to break it out. And, and uh, okay, um, but you're ignoring the top quark, which was found a few years ago and actually has more energy than the Higgs. But, okay. So the way they tie the two together is they say, the reason why a top quark exists is because of interaction with not the Higgs boson, but with the Higgs field. Just seems a little unusual. So last year, at um, one of these particle colliders, they discovered that if you have a large enough stream of proton-proton collisions, about 4 trillion of them, then instead of getting one short-lived quark, and when you, whenever you hear, you hear about top quarks, they're always talking about uh, top quarks are nothing because their life is so short. It's 10 to the minus 18th seconds, a very, very tiny fraction of a second. And we don't directly detect top quarks. We detect them by the residue when they decay. Well, in 2023, uh, there was a particle collider that actually detected not one top quark, but four top quarks from a collision of four trillion proton-proton collisions. So all of a sudden, top quarks are easier to, cre easier to create, and they are in higher quantities than we thought previously. So much so that the top quark is now fighting to be like, not the shortest lived kinds of particles, but up a notch. It's now classified as a longer lived particle or an LLP. Now, don't don't uh, be concerned about longer being a lot longer. Compared to what a top quark was, longer is just eh, longer. It's not like forever. It's just a bit longer. So longer lived particles can travel what they call macroscopic distances. So if it's a top quark and it's very short lived, it's only going to travel like, you know, fractions of a nanometer before it decays into something else. But now they're talking about if you can have enough stream of them, you can get enough quarks together that they'll hang around longer and become a longer-lived longer particle. And a longer-lived particle can be about a second or longer, up to 10 to the plus 10 seconds. That's a lot of seconds. So as it moves up into this next category, and you have more of them because you have a larger source of top quarks, a bigger stream of things that you can make into top quarks. Let's talk about stars. At the end of life of a star, stars can be extremely long lived, but what's left afterwards can last over a billion years. So our sun in about 4 billion years will become a white dwarf. It's kind of the smallest of residue from end of life of stars. The next bigger up, those are neutron stars. They're larger. They're pulsars. That's probably going to be the ultimate fate of Betelgeuse after it goes supernova. And then you have the next up from there, the next bigger, higher energy ones, um, that when the neutron star is big enough and the gravity starts to push on it and condense it, the neutrons split up into mostly neutrons, but a lot of them, the neutrons get ripped apart and you have quarks. And the two quarks that come out of it are the quarks that come out of a neutron, down and up quarks. So you can have a quark star, but it's mostly down and up quarks. The next step up from that, if your star is even bigger, you might have so much gravitational pressure that you squeeze the quarks together and you make bigger quarks. And the, the next bigger quark from up and down is strange. But take that to the next level. And if you squeeze the quarks even closer together, you may actually move up from strange quarks to the biggest quark you can get to is a top quark. That's just my postulation. You can see the progression. But the next step after a 
strange quark star would be a black hole because they're the biggest, heaviest gravity, and you have three different varieties or sizes or masses of black holes. You have the stellar mass black hole. Now, this is a, a star that when it was big and then it collapsed down, what it collapses down, collapses down to is something that's about the gravity of our sun. Our, our sun. So if the, uh, if the sun suddenly became a stellar mass black hole, poof, without any energy coming out of it, you wouldn't notice anything because the gravity would be roughly the same as it is now. But if you got a bigger black hole, that would be known as a medium mass black hole. These things are very rare. We haven't seen enough of them to actually confirm the existence of them. It's like a gap. There's stellar mass black holes, and then there's supermassive black holes at the cores of galaxies, and then nothing in between. We don't yet know exactly what's on the inside of a black hole because we can't detect anything coming out. We can detect stuff on the outer surface of it, beyond the event horizon, spewing energy because it can't take it in fast enough. But inside, we just have a lot of postulations as to what might be there. So what you can take away from all of this is it's, uh, far, more, it's far more than possible that contemporary science has lots left to discover. And in doing so, they may find some uh, ground that they've been standing on, some stakes that they put in the ground that may need to be adjusted to accommodate new observations. But this is common in the pursuit of scientific understanding. The scientific method, the scientific process actually has a way of doing that. Hey, I found the new observation. Let's explain that. Or I've got a postulation. Let's go get some observations to explain that. And that's how science progresses. It's no different than when Einstein came along and said, I've got a different reason why gravity exists. So they took what Newton had said and said, we can refine that a little further. Gravity still exists. Newton stuff still works. But when you start talking about faster and faster particles and larger models, um, then relativity kicks in. We're now seeing that um, quantum physics, which were back in the 1920s, just something people were thinking about, Quantum physics is a matter of fact thing nowadays. And um, we're actually making things at the scalar level, at the physical level that you can see, we're fabricating metamaterials that are exploiting quantum effects. We're actually bending light based upon making little tiny channels and materials where the light gets separated, not by a prism, but by just channels. Those photons are too big. They won't fit in there. But this is big enough to fit that one. So the bigger photons go there and the smaller photons go there. So we're creating scalar, like bigger stuff, that exploit quantum effects. Statements of what is and what is not may have to be revisited based upon newer understandings and newer observations. Something that is unobserved that must exist may turn out to be observing what cannot exist. So, you know, there are people that will now say, um, dark matter doesn't exist because we haven't been able to prove that it exists, but we've been able to show these other observations, and they don't need dark matter. So we may eventually come away and say, yeah, we were on the dark matter bandwagon for a long time, but now we found these other explanations that they'll explain it equally well, and dark matter just goes on the like pushpin board of things that were uh, once thought of, kind of like uh, celestial spheres. Before we came up with this, uh, you know, planets orbiting the sun in our solar system kind of thing, we said, well, they're all hanging on these different geometric 3D models of celestial spheres, no orbits, spheres. That's a very uh, interesting thing to see in the history of the human species, but we don't think that way anymore because we have better explanations for it. The largest things possible and the smallest things possible, be it planets, stars, or galaxies, um, you know, as we put probes out there like the James Webb Space Telescope, some of those boundaries aren't the boundaries that we thought were so hard and fast. And also, as we start doing exploring with bigger radio telescope arrays and in infrared with the James Tele Space Telescope, we're finding that the farthest things might be farther than we thought, or the oldest things, the things that formed earliest, formed faster than we thought. 
they didn't take a long time to form. They were formed and right away, you know, they're popping galaxies and black holes and hmm, more things to think about. And uh, maybe once we spend some time creating new technology to observe that which is currently unobservable, we may find that there are um, further things that we didn't think exist or couldn't exist that are confirmed as existing. And, and that's okay. That's what science is all about. So long as there are reviewed explanations for these things. And as usual, links. Okay, and aside from some numbers, no actual math, no calculus, no derivatives were hurt in the filming of this movie. So people may have seen that standard particle model chart. Who knew that some of the things that are on that chart have never been directly observed and they were just inferred by other things. It's kind of like, you remember when the periodic table of elements had that row that just was like empty? No. But they knew there yeah. should be some things there. And it wasn't until we started having particle colliders that we came about with, yeah, I think there's an element there. And it has this many protons and neutrons, and it lasts for you know four milliseconds and then decays. Yeah, but if you do that again and again, you can prove that it always happens. You have a solid explanation that there's something in the table that should be there. Let's give it a name. But if you look at that row, you'll actually find that I think there's two of them that they're crossing over in their approximate numbers because they're they're so close to each other that. It's kind of like splitting hairs. We know there should be like a, a 113 and a 114, or a 114 and a 115. And uh, 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 well, they're, they're, the atomic weights are really close. But that's, you know, as you start cutting the cheese even thinner, you wind up with cheese that's not quite a solid piece of cheese. Okay, and I promise to get back to regular topics that people can more directly enjoy. Maybe some pictures of things. Oh, we enjoyed that. Uh, yes, I enjoyed it. I have two comic questions. Go for it. Okay. Okay. I have two different comments. And the first one, I gather, will be regarding when you were talking about these um, particles that are long and, and you were saying that they need to build a bigger machine and maybe put it up in space. And I was trying to figure out... Who will finance that? I mean, who? I mean, backing of something usually comes from somebody that thinks that this product is going to help them someday down the road, uh, military or um, something that that you know <laughs> they're going to come out with a new phone or something from the the things that they d discover. I mean, I I, I can't put my mind around who wants to, I mean, yeah, we have the different countries that will back them and stuff like that um, at, at times, but it, it was really hard for me to figure out who is really going to say, I want to invest a lot of money in this thing because we're going to go out in space and we're going to build a thing that's going to be able to measure this stuff. And I'm not even sure where, what they're going to come up with the product for that in the end. I don't know if they know that. The other question had to do with, um, but you were made the comment about why is it um, that people can accept that there's black black forces or black space and they can't um, accept uh, aliens as easily. And, and I, I think for me, it's much easier for me to figure out that there's gobbledygook out there and that there's space and that there's black forces that we didn't know about or talked about be before it used to just be empty space so that's that was easy to accept and now it, they're saying no it's not empty there's stuff in there and we're gonna call it black something or other anyhow but th but that makes it a lot easier than to accept aliens because aliens can be threatening and we don't want to think that we there's a bunch of threatening beings out there. Now, they don't have to be. They could be friendly. They could be helpful. They could develop a lot of wonderful things. But for me, it's much easier to accept the Black Force idea 
that and and or empty space that I accepted that readily. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm not surprised that there's something actually in there, but um, I'm accepting it easily, even though I know that we don't have all the background to say that it's definitely there. We just know it. We don't know what it is, and and so the same thing with aliens. We don't know, and we don't know, but it, but there is that thought that. They could be threatening because we know that we can be threatening to other beings just by our, our history and and uh, in the world is that when we went to other countries and stuff, we we just were there and we exposed them to all kinds of germs and people died just because we went to another country. We didn't even have to fight with them to cause them to have problems. So thinking about an alien, we could think that they don't have to be intentionally um, threatening to us, but by intention, but they can be threatening anyway. Anyway, those were my two comments and thoughts, and I thought that the presentation was very interesting, and I did think about different things, and I really thought that if you maybe Helen can help with giving a presentation on what's available and how people can go about to get into this thing with the saddle. I think that would be fascinating to find out more what they're doing in the colleges and putting out in the outer space. I, I think that's fascinating. Anyway, those are all my comments. Okay. First one is funding. Yes. Um, yes. The U S is more interested in funding um, technology that will provide a near-term benefit to corporations. Mm -hmm. that people, yes. Um, usually it's in the form of metamaterials for improved or lowered manufacturing costs or new capabilities that don't cost as much to implement. But um, there are countries elsewhere in the world that have a different view on things, and they are willing to fund billions of dollars for pure science just for advancing the human awareness of the things around them. Um, uh -huh. For example, the U.S. government was given the opportunity to build a large collider, kind of like the Large Hadron Collider. And Congress said, we're not going to spend that many billions on that thing because it was pure science. The European Union said, I think we've got a few countries that can spare the change to, to build that. And so that's why the Large Hadron Collider is in Europe, is in Europe, is because they were willing to spend the money to do that. They knew that there were going to be thousands of people that get a job directly as a result of the building of that collider. And there were more thousands of people that were going to have jobs that provide the indirect services to all those people. So, you know, there are other countries that get it better than the U.S. gets it as far as spend money to make money. In the U.S., it's all show me the direct Benjamins, whereas elsewhere it's like I see the food chain. Uh, the next thing is uh, the, uh, the wavelengths that are very long. You can think of a sine wave as that sort of ripply thing. If you stretch out a sine wave and you say, how long can it get between bumps? We now know in gravity waves, the distance between those peaks and valleys can be more than a light year. That's like more than one year's worth of the speed of light propagating that wave. And so we, we kind of run out of instruments capable of measuring things that are that long. But we can see that there are things that are longer because we're getting fractions of them. We also know that there's noise the signal that we're measuring, like how high that peak goes, is getting lower and lower. The bumps are getting lower in energy. Once it gets below a certain level, we start seeing that the sensor noise itself, like the false readings of the analog to digital converter, are down in the weeds. And what we want to measure is down too low, and the signal to noise ratio is not high enough. So we have to increase the amplitude of whatever we're measuring and you can only carry that so far before it gets down into the photoelectric effect the chemistry of the sensor itself that's producing the electrons that you're quantifying that you're measuring so once we get down into that level of weeds we don't currently have any technology that can be that sensitive 
Now we've actually created different chemistries, different materials, uh, different compounds for measuring different things. So for example, if you wanna measure light that you can see with your eyes, that's a certain kind of sensor that is CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. That's a CMOS, that's the individual pixels of the camera. But if you wanted to measure, let's say, the x-rays that are going through your bone, because you want to take an x-ray of somebody, the chemistry for that sensor is still dependent upon the photoelectric effect, but it has to be a chemistry that is more sensitive to higher energy photons and ignores the lower energy ones. So you have cadmium sulfide that is the sensor for that. So we, we're experimenting with different types of chemical compounds to see if we can't eke out lower and lower and lower energy levels. But once you get to the point where that photon will not excite an electron out of that material, and you've exhausted the periodic table of elements, you, you've got no more sensing. You, 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 you've exhausted the human awareness of elements and the photoelectric effect to create a sensor to measure something that low in amplitude. You can, you can ramp it up as much as you want, but if you can't measure the initial signal, um, your photo multiplier tube is, you got nothing to multiply. But there are breakthroughs that we don't think about. Yes, and that's where things like, uh, you used to go to the dentist and they would stick little plastic things in your mouth with film on them, plastic uh, emulsions of film, and then you would have an x-ray source that like beams x-rays into your jaw to expose that little film to make an x-ray. And they do that around your mouth. I go to my periodontist for an implant that I'm working on now. And it's like they have a snapshot camera. The snapshot camera uses a solid state emitter to create the stream of x-rays. And it uses a solid state detector that they put inside your mouth is connected up on a USB cable to actually mm -hmm. measure the x-rays. So it's mm -hmm. gone from this big old GE CR mm -hmm. thing and the film plates that they would jam into your mouth down to a reusable, a reusable detector and what looks like a camera. If, if you remember the old style underwater cameras, the body that you'd put your camera inside of and it mm -hmm. was like a bit hefty and your camera would be on the inside of it, and you have buttons on the outside to control it. Right. That's about the size of the X-ray source nowadays. It looks like a, a sort of small size underwater camera body. That's the X-ray source. No big C arm anymore. And the sensor is reusable. And they have different size sensors. So they've got a, a baby sensor for doing X-rays of babies' teeth as they come in. They've got a um, a pediatric sensor for kids, and they've got an adult sensor. And then they've got a slightly larger adult sensor for people with like big jaws. When you have a, when you get a dental x-ray, mm -hmm. or at least when I do it, my dentist uh, and the, the x-ray machine turns on and they tell you don't move, don't breathe, whatever for a second. You hear like a, a pulsing noise while yes. the x-ray is being taken. Is that just uh, to let you know that the, no. the radioactive stuff is exposed or is there a no. function to that pulsing noise. No, the, the old style uh, X-ray emitters, um, the X-ray tubes, um, they operate between 15 and 35,000 volts on the plate. And you don't generate that directly from a 110 volt outlet. What you do is you have a circuit in there that has some enormous capacitors and the capacitors charge up and then discharge. And if you remember um, flash cameras, flash cameras before LEDs used to have xenon tubes in them. And when you would take a flash picture, you would hear this. Yeah. The, the capacitor is discharging. And then you would hear like <laughs> as the capacitor was recharging. That's what the old x-ray tubes have to do. Now, <laughs> the other thing is the um, there are um, x-ray scanners where the cadmium sulfide scanner is on one side of the unit and the x-ray source is on the other side of the unit and they do a whole head scan of your jaw. That's right. All around. So you, you, sort of, you sort of put your chin on this plate, they adjust yeah. the plate height until you're right in the beam energy of your tooth line. And then it yeah. goes, 
and it, it, it you know, takes a couple of passes and it does a multiple exposure. And that's why you have to sit still is it's doing a fast scan multiple times and then integrating the scans. And then it can produce a 3D layout of your entire jaw. Yeah. Cool. And since it's digital, there's no film costs. Yeah, the money part is where it gets you know, really sort I'm, of funny. I'm waiting for the day when I can have a combined CT MRI by walking through my front door. <laughs> As I leave the house, what's my body status? As I come home, what's my body status? That's what no. you're waiting for? You yeah. know what I'm waiting for is uh, Dr. McCoy's table where you just lay down and he, he can do everything on that table. He can see everything, okay. he can scan everything, okay. um, and he can fix everything. I don't, know about, I don't know about fixing it, but you're probably going to be surprised to know that bio beds already exist. Like he had at yes. that, that level? Yes. yes. They can well, already I measure, they can already yeah. measure your heart rate, your respiration, and your systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Yeah. Just by, laying on, just by you laying on the bed. Yeah. Right, right. But he, he, he could do a lot of other things than that. All that data winds up on a display and immediately goes into your personal medical records. Yes. So they don't have to like write things down on a slate and then erase them later or, or write them down by what's on the display and then walk out into the other room and hand transcribe them into your medical records and then erase that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're right. That was what it, it, it's amazing. But I, I know that one of the amazing things that they did do is that they can do with the tables now or bed. They do it with people's beds. Is they can weigh you while you're in the bed. Oh yeah. Can, I, I've, um, I've, actually, I've actually worked with folks at Stryker and Hillrom on how that works. The um, quantum technology the subatomic quantum technology that is um, essentially pressure producing electrons on a material, the piezoelectric effect, that's how they weigh you in the bed. Your body's pressure on multiple sensors on the bed is averaged to come up with your weight. And that so they can measure your weight, which is great because twice or three times a day, your body weight will just be automatically measured because you're laying in the bed and it will go into your medical records where the nurse no longer has to get you out of the bed onto the scales or hang you on the scale to measure your weight. Yeah. Great improvement in patient satisfaction. The other thing is if I can measure your weight, what else can I tell? I can tell when you get your ass up out of the bed. Yeah. I can tell when a patient goes to the bathroom because they leave the bed, I see their weight depart from the bed, they go into the bathroom and the infrared sensor turns the bathroom lights on. You don't have a pull chain in there anymore to turn the lights on. So I can connect in your medical records, you got up, you went to the bathroom. <laughs> yes. Hey, we're past the bewitching hour, folks. No. What? Well, thank you for all the information tonight. I appreciate yeah. it. Ah, what? see, now I sent you the, I sent you the PDF with the email. So if it's too much information, it's TMI, too much information, you can always go back and peruse the PDF at your own pace. And the PDF, all the links at the end, you can click on them. You don't have to like copy and paste them. You just click on them. You're looking at the PDF, just click on them. They'll open your web browser and take you to that site. And, um, you know, feel free to peruse. How does he come up with these things? Uh, uh, I, I supply my sources. Well, I um, appreciate all the information after the presentation, too. Okay. It's almost 110. We're an hour <laughs> plus past oh, the yeah. aging hour. Yes. Yeah. It's been yeah, an enjoyable, like con days. It's yeah, been an enjoyable conversation, but I think for all of our own better health, I think we need to end it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go okay. and make some popcorn Well, thank now. you very much. I enjoyed it greatly. Yes. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank thank you. I learned your a lot. Patience. <laughs> you and you did change my mind about a lot of things tonight. There's some things you didn't, but most I, of them you did. <laughs> that, that's okay. I don't. I don't expect to change everybody's mind about everything. No. Oh, good. It's, good. it's always great to hear things, different yeah. opinions. It, it, it is. It is very good. 
Not, okay. not everybody's exposed to all this minutia like I expose myself to. So <laughs> <laughs> let us suffer with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.